Today's webinar is co-hosted by Community Funded and Total Advancement Solutions presented by Generis. Just some quick background, Community Funded uh, helps our partners create a mobile optimized fundraising page and events and easily manages initiatives like crowdfunding, giving days, uh, giving sites across multiple campuses, departments, and chapters. And our platform integrates directly with your brand, your website, and your existing payment processor to tie everything together with one seamless solution. And then Total Advancement Solutions, presented by Generis, is a fundraising consulting firm that serves Christian organizations across the U.S. and world. Whether you are in higher education, private schools, or faith-based organization, funding your vision can't be left to chance. And that's where TAS collaborates with you to weave together your biblical principles, your vision, your best giving practices, and your organization's DNA into a strategy that will help accelerate generosity. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kim here and uh, let her uh, get started here with this webinar. Um, before I do that, a couple of housekeeping things. So please use our Q&A function to um, ask any questions that might uh, come up throughout. We will save time at the very end to answer as many of those questions as possible. And also in that Q&A section, you'll also see links if you want to be able to connect directly with the team at Total Advancement Solutions or Community Funded um, with any more specific questions that you might have to your organization. With that said, let me unmute all the hosts here and let's turn it over to Kim. Okay, there we go. Thanks so much, Katie. Thank you. Um, the goal of today's webinar is for every organization, regardless of size, to walk away with actionable steps for a solid, successful giving day strategy if you decide that a giving day is right for your organization. So we're going to briefly discuss a few realities and objectives of giving days with the intention that your organization will learn enough to feel equipped to make a choice on having a giving day at all. And therefore, if you're feeling pressured perhaps by your board or others that, uh, to have one, but you don't feel it's right for your organization, we want you to leave this webinar feeling more informed and supported in your decision. And for those who um, want to move forward with a giving day, if it's right for you, we're gonna cover the markers of readiness and the critical elements for a successful strategy and execution. And we're gonna have some fabulous case study information um, presented as well. And uh, in a little bit, we'll also pop some links in the chat bar. Um, if you would like to connect with any of us here at Generis or Community Funded, uh, you can follow those links to set up a meeting with any one of us um, a little bit later. So first, uh, let's talk about establishing the objective of a giving day. Should your organization even hold one? And what are a few uh, of the pros and cons to having a giving day? So Jennifer, do you want to start, start us off with this? I would love to. Thanks. Uh, well, if you're interested in having a giving day, which I assume all of you are because you're on this call, either interested or a board member is telling you you need to. Um, if you have the interest in it, I would say go ahead and pursue it, but you need to be ready. Um, let me tell you a couple benefits of a giving day. One of them is that you can focus on a really specific project like funding 10 student scholarships or purchasing two school buses. Um, anytime you really hone in and focus your message on something, you're likely to engage your audience if you do it well. So that's one of the benefits. Um, giving days are also a great opportunity to onboard new donors. If they're done well, donor acquisition might actually be one of the biggest wins for your organization on a giving day because you can reach people via social media and kind of peer to peer influence, even if they are alumni or people that perhaps you don't currently have contact information for. All right, I'm going to jump in. I'm, I'm Todd. I'm going to come with a digital perspective. Um, so with a forecasted 20 billion impressions that are uh, forecasted for social media this year, year that is um, that coupled with, I think they said 20% of all Americans are going to be involved in a giving Tuesday, whether it's asking, whether it's um, 
you know, giving or sharing. It feels like sometimes it's a no brainer to be involved in at least the giving Tuesday day. Um, but I, I tell people frequently, you can't go from couch potato to a sprinter overnight. And if you're not already having some kind of sophisticated, um, you know, digital strategy for your organization, it's going to be really hard to go from two to 11 or four to 11. And so I suggest that if you, if you, you already have to have some pretty healthy channels along the way, otherwise it's just not a magic day that, uh, social media is going to go viral or your emails just all of a sudden going to produce wow just because of a hashtag or a, or a campaign. So I ask people when they're looking at their pros and cons to think through this lens and that is, is this, do you want a lift or a shift? And a lift is new donors that maybe they don't know about you and that requires one strategy or a shift is moving donors that or people in your database um, and sort of shifting their giving day to a particular day and not and knowing whether or not you uh, which one of those you want to focus on helps you decide whether or not you should do this or not and I know that Kim and Jennifer have a lot of ideas of how you can ask but I think sometimes when I ask that question are you looking for a lift or a shift a lot of people will say yes and the answer is you're, you're a little greedy if you think you're gonna get both but you can, but you just have to aim differently. And so I'll talk a little bit more about lift and shift as we go out throughout our, um, our seminar here. So Kim, I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Todd. Um, I think that some of the info, um, a really big pro to a giving day, a really concentrated period of time is that if you can, um, use uh, that opportunity to engage your influencers. So for people who are in your community, who can spread your word far and wide. It's a fantastic opportunity to rally them. And um, if you equip them and really get them ready to um, amplify your message, it's a great opportunity, opportunity to do that. And um, when you use those influencers and they're talking about your organization far and wide, there is a, a level of val uh, validity that they bring to it because people obviously give to people. We all know that. Um, so they're talking to their folks, they're influencing people, and they're talking about your organization. And, uh, and so it, it's a really strong message when we can give our influencers something really um, strong to rally around. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, though, is that it can be, one, one drawback is that it can be a, a transactional kind of um, of day. So you'll just need to be prepared for that, have um, some sort of plan in, in place. So if you have, for example, someone that you're hoping is going to make a, a certain size gift, um, and then on giving day, they come in with a much, much smaller gift. Um, so just be prepared for that. Be prepared for your follow-up conversation with those folks. Um, you don't want to uh, to just leave that be because chances are good that they were giving that because they want to be involved. They want to be helpful for your organization. But in reality, if you're engaging them face to face in a conversation about um, about their investment in the vision of your organization, they're going to welcome that conversation, even though they've made a smaller gift to your give day previously. So just be ready for that, uh, you, you know, for your plan to, um, to be prepared to counteract those kinds of transactional um, gifts. So um, something I, I also wanted to mention really briefly is that, and we'll talk about this later, is that you know, Give Day doesn't have to be on Giving Tuesday. I know that there's a lot of chatter about that and about pros and cons of that. And so we just wanna reiterate that. I think that um, if there's a, a great, opportunity in your organization, like a Founders Day or, or some other day that has meaning in your organization, perhaps that's a stronger choice for the day to do your giving day. And that's fine. Um, giving Tuesday comes with a lot of noise, both good and bad. So, um, so there's pros and cons to choosing Giving Tuesday itself. But, um, but we just want to reiterate that it doesn't necessarily have to be on Giving Tuesday that you have your giving day. It can still be a fantastic success another time during, during the year. So. Um, so that kind of transitions, transitions us to actually talking about readiness. Are we, are we ready to have, if we're going to have it, are, are you ready to have a giving day? So Todd, I'm, I think we'll start with you uh, if you want to talk about some readiness factors. Sure. Um, 
one of the phrases I use all the time with my clients is when it comes to a giving day, whether it's giving Tuesday or another one, is the juice worth the squeeze? It takes a lot of work to be successful on any kind of campaign, especially when your campaign is shrunk to a 24 hour period, right? That's really difficult. So is, is, is all your effort um, going to be worth it? Well, let's go back to that lift versus shift a little bit. I wanna tie in, expand a little bit what Kim was saying, that when you know whether you're looking for a lift or a shift, it reveals opportunities because Founders Day makes a lot of sense when uh, you're talking to people who already know who you are and that, would, that makes sense or if you're, you're trying to get scholarships for, um, you know, for students or things like that. But you need to have a whole nother um, strategy if you're, if you're reaching out, right? So decide whether you're reaching in or reaching out, and then you'll know whether or not you're even ready to create this campaign. Um, the other thing is, is being all in. Um, I, one of the organizations, actually two that I've worked at, we had what we called racquetball rooms. And they were literally um, rooms with whiteboards on all the walls, and you sort of opened your door and walked in. And we wrote from the ceiling to the floor all the way around for our campaigns and that's what it takes. I have, I've been involved in quite a few, I've done, I've done this for 25 years at this point, digital fundraising, and I have yet to see a successful campaign without a lot of work put in to the idea of literally what's, what's our A-B testing going to be for, um, for uh, you know, emails that go out and subject lines, what happens if this, this post goes viral, what are we going to do? What, what happens if it doesn't go viral, what are we gonna do? Which also ties into the second part of, I wrote down, manning the ship. Um, it, as you have to be ready to react on that day, this is not a campaign that you would wanna set it, then forget it. So you need to be around so that, um, I would actually tell my employees, don't go to Disneyland on this date, don't plan that. We need you in the building and we need to be prepared. And I'm gonna throw this one real quick before I, I hand it back off, but um, a little tidbit. If you come up with a campaign and let's say you wanna raise $2 million, when you go online, don't put you have a $2 million goal because you're probably not gonna reach your $2 million goal on, online and people are not going to jump on board when they see, oh, I've raised $200 out of 2 million, right? Keep it smaller, people like to, um, support winners and momentum and they want to get you over the hump. So have an online goal and have an offline goal. And you're, you're not lying, you're just sort of saying our online goal is $2,000. Because what if you hit it? Expand it because your, your team is there and you can react to that kind of information. So I know that was in the weeds, but I just wanted to throw that in there. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, Jen, uh, back to you, Jennifer. Thanks, Todd. Uh, jumping on to what Todd said, um, one of the things in terms of readiness um, is to prime the pump. So if you have a significant goal, well, whatever your goal is for your giving day, uh, some of those influencers and kind of buzz builders that Kim's talking about, the people that you're getting on board early, um, ask them to make their gifts, ask them to do it early. It's really great if early in the day people can see or you can report that some big gifts have come in. Um, I agree with Todd, you don't want to put your big giant goal out there and then and then not hit it, but um, it's, a, it's really momentum building. If you can get some people, it's kind of like, a, it's a mini campaign, right? So it's sort of your lead givers, if you will, uh, to get them to participate early. Um, the other thing that's important is to assess what your goals are. Todd's talked about that. Um, what are you looking for? I always encourage my clients to list um, a financial goal. I mean, internally when we're planning, what's your financial goal? And then what are our non-financial goals? So you might be trying to raise $50,000 for student scholarships. That's great. That's a good goal. But maybe some of your other goals are um, engaging alumni that you haven't connected with in a long time. Or maybe another goal is um, building a better partnership between your alumni office and your development office and having a really successful event together. So um, make sure you know what you're trying to hit. And I always say, don't just have a financial goal. Make sure you know what your other wins are. Kim. Oh, thank you very much. So uh, piggybacking on that, um, talking about the teams working together, um, my biggest question or, or my part about the readiness, I would say is, is your team ready? Who is your team and are they ready? So it's not just the folks who they're in the office with you. Um, it, you know, it's also obviously communications folks. It's other 
um, the, in, the buzz builders and the influencers who are within your community. Is your board on board? Are they ready to like give it it all? It doesn't say that they have to give gigantic, gigantic amounts, but are they going to sing your praises? Are they going to spread it far and wide about the news? Um, and if it's just you, if you don't have a big team behind you, that's totally fine too. It's, it can be doable. Just think in scale and, my, and make sure that you're prioritizing what it is that you really want to get done. Think about, um, about what you want to get done in terms of your goals because you can't get it all done. So let's prioritize. And um, I think that it, it, I really cannot in, uh, say enough and emphasize enough the importance of having those buzz builders, those influencers um, who are going to spread it far and wide, but they need to be equipped. So you need to have a plan in place in terms of giving them their talking points, giving them the timeline, um, giving them all of the uh, pieces that they're going to need for success. Um, and I think that, Danielle, would you, uh, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Um, so, you know, one question that we get really often over here at Community Funded is, can I do more than one giving day? Or should I do more than one giving day? Um, and I think it really boils down to a lot of things, but it starts with your annual plan. Um, you can look at your calendar year and say, you know, we plan to do um, a March Madness Athletics Challenge in the spring. And then once school gets back in the fall, we're really gonna focus on a student week uh, because that's a big push for us. We need to focus on scholarships. And then once we hit Thanksgiving, you know, it's gonna turn into Giving Tuesday, our end of fiscal year push. Um, a lot of the institutions we work with have their own giving day, uh, like was mentioned earlier, you know, a Founders Day, a specific day that's important to them. A lot of times we see those single days are kind of singled out in the springtime. Uh, but it, it comes down to your plan. You know, who are you promoting to? When are you promoting to those people? And you look at, you know, what happened this past spring, for example. Uh, we work with partners all over the United States that had huge giving days planned. And then the COVID crisis hit and everyone thought, well, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, it, it's so sensitive. Can I still reach out to people? What can I do? Uh, the biggest thing was we still have needs. We still need funding now more than ever. And so I think it's really important to understand that you can pivot, whether it is an unfortunate crisis that comes up, or maybe it's, you know, your football team makes it to states and you decide that you're going to have to do a really big push around athletics uh, to support them, to support the team members, the band members, and everybody, you know, to allow them to travel. And so we've seen giving days and giving events for all sorts of things like that. And I think the answer is yes, you can do more than one giving event like that a year. Um, it doesn't have to be a single day push. It could be multiple days. It could have multiple focuses. Or uh, back to what Jennifer said earlier, it can be all about buying one school bus. You know, it could be one focus. Um, and the key is really in your planning. You know, you can always, you know, incorporate those emergency or, you know, needs that come up out of the blue. But if you plan for it in advance, you have a better chance of being successful. And the second thing I'll say about that is it also boils down to segmentation. Um, you know, you can think about you have one group of donors that always comes in and supports athletics and that's across the board. They'll show up at any event, but their focus, their affinity is athletics. Um, and so you think about that when you have these days. You might have a, a, a giving challenge where you're only targeting alum, you're only targeting a very specific group of alum. And so I think when you actually boil it down to planning, you have to think to further of who are we approaching? Because you don't want to have five giving days in a year where you're sending the same message to everybody every time. Um, you know, then you'll, you'll run the risk of burning out donors, you'll run the risk of having people opt out of some of your messaging. And so if you plan carefully and you think about your segments, you can be really successful in doing this. Um, and I, I think it really all comes down to those two things. So uh, today I'm actually going to share my screen with you and kind of give a few examples of what that looks like. Uh, this is one of our really wonderful partners, the University of Richmond. Uh, they are doing, actually right now, this is live, they're doing a Spiders Helping Spiders Challenge, and they are the spiders, that's their mascot. Um, so the focus here is alumni giving back to students. Um, 
you know, this is a really cool event. They've done it several years in a row. As you can see here, they have a goal, um, $300,000 goal. Uh, they already have over 600 donors in the door and they have very focused needs. Um, right now they're worried about student needs. So financial aid, student emergency fund, which is huge right now. Um, and then the career opportunity fund. So it's all about students. Um, and the focus is very clear. You can land on this page. You can opt into something that you care about. Um, there are some matches that we'll get into in a little while here that you can have your impact doubled throughout the event. Um, but they're not promoting this to their community at large. They're, commu they're only promoting it to, you know, alum that are coming in the door that can give back and help. And of course, other people can land on this page and, and support as well. But the key here is that this is segmented um, and people know that it's coming up. And now that they've done it a few years in a row, I bet that there are a lot of you know, alum out there that are coming back and they know that this is happening. So they are planning to give their gift at this time. And we've seen this event grow year after year. So if you're looking at this and you're thinking, um, you know, I, I don't know that we can bring in that, that type of participation. You know, this event has grown year after year and you can start really small. You can start just with your emergency fund or just for your food pantry. Um, something that you know resonates with that audience um, and you, know, you could start small with your goals as well. I wanted to paint this picture that the University of Richmond also does a huge campus-wide giving day each year. So this is something small that they're doing, or smaller, I should say, that they're doing in the fall. This giving day is in the spring. Um, you can see the results are a little bit bigger and so is their focus. You can land here and you can say, I really care about student life. And once this page loads, you'll see there's all different student life options on this page for you to give to. Um, so they can segment just like they did earlier with this event, but the goal here is a little bit bigger. Uh, the audience is definitely more significantly larger and the options for people to give um, are definitely different, a lot broader, and it really does encompass everything. Someone can land on this page and find something that they care about. Um, and I think that that's really important because they're not burning donors out. They're just engaging them at different times of year, different groups of donors. You know, and uh, just a few other options that we've seen, um, you can have a targeted event where you only are focused on one specific thing. Uh, this is another partner of ours. They have an athletics giving week. Um, you can see here that you can opt in and find volleyball, football, whatever you care about, whatever your son or daughter participated in. Um, maybe it was a team that you were part of when you were back at this school really important to think about, again, who's your audience, who are you trying to bring to the page, and is this content relevant? Um, we also see all the time reunion giving. Reunion giving happens across the board. Uh, this is actually really cool because it, this one is also live right now, um, and it's a battle of the decades. So you can come here and you can say, you know, I'm part of the 2000s. I'm going to make my gift to support this decade, and when you scroll down, you can see a different leaderboard of who's winning. It makes it competitive, it helps with engagement, um, but it's also targeted. They're reaching out to these people separately, asking them to come to the page and support their decade. Um, so I think it's really fun. You can have different ways of engaging your donors throughout the year, and you can also really just focus on one thing or multiple things. It all comes down to your planning and who you're looking to engage at that time. Um, so I know we went through a, a few different examples today. We're going to share all of them as, as part of the follow-up so that you can look at these live and click through them and, and find more information. But with that, I'm actually going to stop sharing for a moment. Um, and I am going to uh, hand it back over to Kim so that she can talk a little bit more about the elements of a giving day. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so I wanted to just talk about a few practical matters about uh, two major things, one being your influencers and biz, buzz builders, and then also the topic of matching. So regarding the buzz builders, or as I call them, or, their, or your influencers, um, we've talked about the importance of them, or I have talked about the importance of them, in my opinion. Um, so the, some ways that you can um, gather folks that are already in your community, if you're in a school, for example, I mean, you may already have committees or parent groups or something else that you can work with, if there are groups of volunteers that your nonprofit or are, is already working with, these are people who are already built in that you can bring in from the beginning, gather them close and uh, get them on board, give them some skin in the game, help them uh, to understand 
your vision about where you're going with this and have them um, help strategize a little bit so that they have a sense of personal excitement uh, about what it is that they're doing and they're going to be more likely to to jump in and help you and reach out on social media and amplify your message. A couple of things that um, if you do do that, if you go recruit folks to help you or you go out and, and gather up those who are already in your community. Um, some ways to use them are to um, use them to call ahead of time as a save the date kind of way. You can use them to call during the day to remind people if you're coming up on a deadline, just leaving a message, uh, is, you'll get a lot of messages, which is fine, but at least it gives them a place to remind and um, take action because that's the hard part about a giving day is we promote it and promote it and promote it, but then it might slip by in their busy, busy day and they don't see it on the social media and they miss the email until eight o'clock the following morning. So um, having some folks out there on the phones uh, is sometimes helpful. And then if, if you want to, you could consider having them make some phone calls like the day after to do some thank yous, but also if there were gifts that you were expecting that didn't come in, you can reach out to those people and say, it's not too late. We would really appreciate so much if you could join, uh, join in this special thing that we're doing. Um, so regarding matches, I think that matches are a really strategic and important piece of uh, trying to come up with a good strategy for your mat, um, sorry, your giving day. A couple of things, I, remember that your goal will lead to your tactics. So for example, as you are, if you're looking to raise dollars, then I would suggest perhaps the match that you're looking for is to be able to do a, a, a double your money or two to one or whatever the, that kind of a idea. But if your goal is to raise donors, then the dollar figure itself may be a little less important and you might consider um, structuring it like an unlock kind of match where if you have 50 donors, for example, 50 donors by noon, then we will have this amazing opportunity by these anonymous donors who are going to give uh, $30,000 toward the purchase of the bus or whatever that might be. So um, depending on what your goal is, then I, you know, that, will lead you to plan out your tactic. And regarding finding your match, a match can be a really great opportunity to steward someone, um, to gather them closer to your organization. And um, so they're gonna be nine times out of 10, somebody who's already, maybe 10 times out of 10, somebody who's already in your organization and giving generously or somewhat generously, you're hoping that they will um, increase their support is our hope. Um, and that you are asking them to be a part of this vision. So it's not necessarily that the, the motivator isn't that they are going to give a bigger gift. The motivator is that their gift is going to enable all this other amazing magic to happen, that all these other people are going to be inspired by the match. And so if you can inspire them with that kind of vision, then you're going to be more successful uh, securing a match. A couple of things you might consider, um, you might have a group of people together, so it doesn't have to be one person or one couple. It could be several people uh, coming together as a pool. It could be themed. Danielle talked about the, the by decade. It could be a, a person per decade. Um, so it could be a theme. And I mentioned briefly about the amount of the match. I've had success pre before where we were raising number of donors and the match ended up being a fairly small dollar figure. We just had a couple of families put a thousand dollars in. And so the match was only $3,000, which is compared to sometimes it's a hundred thousand or more, but so the match is $3,000, but we were, we blew the numbers out of the water. Donors really, really responded to that because they were excited to be able to, that their gift is enabling not only for the organization to do well, but it's getting this extra money for their for the organization that they love. So that's a really big deal. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is, ideally, ideally, when you're looking for a match donor, it's hopefully going to be new money. So, um, but it is it is possible, and there are times where it's somebody who has already said to you and pledged, I, you know, I'm going to give you such and such amount of money this year. You can ask them to to be part of your match or to be your match. Um, that's totally fine and happens, but the ideal situation is when you're looking for new money to inspire people to give over and above to, to be your match. I think, and Danielle has some really great, another um, uh, uh, sample, that's the word I can think of. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kim. That, yeah, that's exactly spot on. You know, these matches and challenges are 
are really helpful. It doesn't mean your event won't be successful if you don't have them, but it does help you engage at different levels with, with a different audience. Um, this is a really cool example. This one's actually just getting started. Um, you can see here they have different areas for someone to support. As we look down, um, there is an incentive to give. You know, every donor that gives at a certain level, that at this case, it's a hundred dollars. They do get a pair of socks for this fraternity, and then there's different giving levels to opt into, um, and there's a challenge too. So if they hit a milestone of fifty thousand dollars, they have a seventy-five hundred dollar match, um, and so that's a really cool challenge. Specifically, it helps them promote. Um, as they're getting closer to $50,000, they call out this donor. Um, it really helps with the momentum of the day or the event at large. It doesn't have to just be one day. Um, and then there are some other different types of challenges here. Uh, you have, you know, when 10 current or former staff members give, um, when 10 specific brothers of this fraternity give at any level, um, when 20 brothers give. I think it's really important too, because you think about, uh, back to what Kim said, who's, who's giving this match um, or who's actually pledging this reward that's given to the event. And sometimes that donor has really specific intentions. They might say, I'm going to give $10,000 to this event, but I really, really want it to go to this scholarship fund. You know, that's where my affinity is. That's what we like to support each year. And that's really great. You can consider how do I meet my goals by really trying to pair this donor's interest with the challenge that we have. And so um, a lot of times that helps you, you know, create and shape the different incentives that you have. Um, another example here, um, different challenges. This is a really cool giving event. Um, you know, the 50 states challenge, if they're able to get participation from all 50 states, a power hour, this is very common um, and also very successful. We see these a lot at the beginning and at the end of a, a giving day a lot of times. So it could be a rush hour challenge in the morning um, where you're trying to push people to give early before they get to work or before they get into their work day. Um, and then we also see um, sometimes that there's a similar challenge later in the day. Uh, sometimes we see that there is an early challenge that just says, you know, replace your cup of coffee this morning with a donation of $5. And so they're really just trying to think about time-based challenges. Um, how can we promote in this one hour, drive the urgency for someone to give, reward them for giving, maybe double their impact, um, but also make them feel really good about it. And I think that it helps with, again, you know, different donor touch points throughout the day. Sometimes it helps as you're segmenting, maybe you're trying to get 100 alumni in the door. Um, and so your focus is just alumni for that actual communication. You're trying to drive them in between the hours of 12 and five. It really helps you um, because you're, you're driving that urgency to give during that time. Um, and also it makes them feel really great about their gift because they are seeing a reward or they're seeing, you know, a significant impact there. Um, and so there's all sorts of challenges that you can build in. I wanted to go back to this example I showed earlier with the, the different alumni challenge that's going on right now. They do have uh, different matches um, for their event. So you can see here, there's a match for financial aid. This is one-to-one. -one, um, so it's matching dollar for dollar as, as donations are coming through the door. Um, this is also a match for student emergency fund and then the career opportunity fund. So you can actually, maybe you have that $3,000 match like Kim said earlier, but maybe you're splitting it up three different ways to drive different groups to give. Um, so I think it's helpful. It's, it's helpful in a lot of ways and it, it, can't, it shouldn't be discouraging if you don't have a match, um, but also as you build out these digital programs over time and you start to really flesh out what is, what's our goal look like? You know, what do we want for our participation? Who do we want to be giving? All of that, you, you really pair some of those bigger major gifts that you have coming in the door with those goals so that you have an incentive for the people that you want to be giving to give that day. Um, so again, I'm gonna be sharing all of these examples with everyone afterwards. If you have questions about incentives, you can reach out to us, but it is a really great way to keep the momentum during your event. And with that, I will stop sharing again and I'm gonna hand it over to Todd. Thank you, Daniel. So I'm going to give um, th this section, I think we're talking sort of the critical element. So I'm going to give my um, digital perspective. One, I th I'm so glad Danielle's showing us really what I would call uh, the cream of the crop. This is great website content for a giving day, but I'm surprised how many people um, go into a giving day with a attitude of we're just going to use our channels 
to ask for gifts and then leave the website the, in the same state it was in, right? Your website should mm -hmm. echo whatever your campaign is. And a lot of people try to use the same, just they keep their homepage the same. They don't have anything in their navigation about the push or the campaign. And they even try to go to the original donation page. And I highly suggest creating you know, landing pages for your campaign and even a different donation page for multiple reasons. I mean, one, your case for support is different. It's not the same case for support you already have going the other time, you know, the other days of the year. And secondarily, um, clean accounting of knowing, you know, measuring your, you know, it was the juice worth the squeeze. You know, I, I find, I think that some of our Giving Tuesday stats are skewed a little bit because there's a lot of money that already goes to nonprofits all year round. And then to say, oh, we made this much on giving Tuesday. Well, how much were you already going to make anyway? Meaning um, don't, don't assume that everything you got on your, your day was um, just for that effort. So I like clean accounting um, when you create your funnel on your website. Um, also, follow-up. Um, a special ask demands a special follow-up. Whether, whether, once again, we're on the... Um, the lift versus a shift. Is this somebody's first gift to the ministry? Do you need to react accordingly? And they may need a different landing, uh, not only landing page after they donate, but that little welcome stream is different than somebody who gave an additional gift. So think through your funnel and think through how you want to talk to them. And I'll end with this because I tell all my, um, all my clients this, if you ask for a dollar for, to, 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 dig a well in Africa um, for a village. Your next email to me better be you buying a shovel, digging a hole, or showing a, a kid drinking clean water before you ask me for another dollar. Show me that my dollar did something, and then I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll give you that second dollar. So sometimes what happens in these campaigns, we see it as a one-day push, and then we move on to, to, to whatever we were doing before. Don't forget to go back and thank, uh, thank people accordingly and follow up before you ever ask them or just throw them in your normal stream because you're going to ask them for another dollar without proving that their other dollar did anything. So don't forget that. So, um, and I think I hand over to Jennifer. Thanks, Todd. Such good ideas. Uh, so a couple more things to think about critical elements uh, on your giving day. Um, I just want to point out it's come up a couple times here and I've seen in some of the questions from our audience prior to the event, you know, how do we make this fun and interesting? And, um, you know, we saw some great examples of websites and creativity. I, this is a place to be creative on a Giving Tuesday. Um, I have clients who've done things like, um, you know, send out stickers ahead of time to people in the mailing so that people can put a sticker on um, and take a picture of themselves saying, you know, I love Big Valley Christian School or uh, students and families who will make a sign that say I gave to Big Valley Christian School because uh, and post that on the website. Um, I love the socks. That's so fun. Those are something people will get later. But if you've already got something like that, that's a part of your culture, people wearing picture, wearing their socks, you know, that kind of thing. Um, find some ways to make it fun. This should be a fun day. Um, but when your giving day is over, it's really important to identify what your wins were and then communicate them both internally and externally. Um, so again, be creative. Um, this is the time to send a personal thank you note to new donors or to send a sticker or to do, to send a video showing, as Todd said, <laughs> um, hey, we bought the shovel and now we're starting to dig. Look, um, be creative in the way you follow up with your givers. Um, also, and it was mentioned here, but if you were really close to your goal and there were some givers you haven't heard from, you can take that next day to say, hey, you still have an opportunity to help us buy five more shovels, right? Um, and you can still spread that out a little bit and get a few other um, gifts. When your giving day is over, and I like to do it pretty close to the event, I always want my teams to sit down and have a debrief session. And I'm like, Todd, I love whiteboards. So uh, we want to go back and look at what were our original goals for the day? How did we do related to those goals? How much money did we raise? How many new givers did we get? How well did we partner with the alumni office that we really wanted to, to build? How did our technology work? What were the glitches? What were the pivots? Um, and then 
document that, write all that stuff down and put it in a place where you can have it because that's your starting point for your next giving day. And as Danielle said, you may do more than one giving day in a year. So um, get all that, keep it, um, as Todd would say, kind of do a brain dump and uh, get everything in there. And then your next giving day will be better because of what you learned on this one. So um, I'm going to toss back to Katie Haystead and she's going to moderate some questions for us. And then I just want to point out as well that in the chat bar, there are now two um, links that you can use if you want to get a, a follow up uh, conversation with a strategist from Generis or somebody at Community Funded. Both of those links are in the chat bar and I'm going to toss it to Katie. Great, thank you so much uh, to all four of you for walking through that, all great information. And uh, when you present great information, you get in return great questions. Um, and that's what we have here. I'm gonna go, uh, Brian, I know you sent yours in first, but I'm gonna go to that were uh, kind of hot topics here when we were talking about it. But the idea of challenges and matches definitely made some people think. Um, so, going to put two questions together that Ellen and Matt had here and um, are anonymous challenges and matches as effective as those where you can share a donor's name um, and, and kind of tying together what would be the best practices or most effective when, when looking at challenge and reward options. Uh, Kim or Jennifer, you want to lead with that? Danielle, feel free to add at the end. Mm -hmm. I can speak to that if you want. Um, so I've had, I've been experienced, I've been, I have experienced both um, anonymous and not anonymous. And I think that it depends, honestly, who you're reaching out to. I feel like, um, and, and also the messaging. So, and the one time that I can think of, um, of the give days that I've been a part of, where we had a donor who had, who their name was known that person was chosen um, very specifically because it, that person also was a very significant influencer. And so we knew that the point of, um, you know, part of the objective was to get people to give because they would follow this person's lead. So if that is um, someone in your community that, um, that can bring along a bunch of people, that's a huge win. If you don't have someone like that, um, or that person is not willing to, you know, to do that, we've had, um, in my experience, we've had folks who, um, who would be an influencer, but really wanted to be anonymous. The, we didn't necessarily find that people didn't give because they didn't know who it was. They still, I, I think people are motivated by different things. And we, as fundraisers, as we're presenting the options and we're messaging things, we have to remember that one message isn't going to meet every listener. So some people are going to be motivated by giving because it's their fellow alumnus. And some people are going to be motivated to, motivated to give because they want the match and the best for the organization, regardless of who put that match up. So it doesn't kind of answer, I don't think there's really a better thing. I think it kind of depends on, I think you could have a win either way. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Danielle, I'm going to toss one over to you. We've, we've gotten quite a few questions both before and also after uh, while you guys were talking about the idea of using your community, that idea of peer-to-peer -peer ambassadors or champions. Um, I know we deal a lot of, with this uh, at Community Funded. Um, so do you have any, uh, a couple questions here. Um, but what are the best practices for utilizing your community? Um, and are there ways that you can use them that's not just about getting them to ask for money or getting them to give money, but how can you truly uh, create this army of champions uh, on your giving day? Yeah, yeah, great questions, Katie, um, and questions that we do hear pretty often. So I would say some best practices, um, a few of them we highlighted earlier, but the first is, you know, sometimes we work with institutions that they're wondering, you know, who are our, our champions, our 
different ambassadors that are going to promote for us. We don't have a volunteer base. You know, who can we reach out to? Um, and maybe it starts with a student organization, or maybe it, it starts with your board. Um, maybe it just starts with different volunteers or parents that are involved in your community. Um, and then I saw another question that came in that, that relates to this, so I'll bring it in, um, about alumni. How can alumni help with this promotion? I think it can be any of the following. It, you don't have to have a dedicated base of volunteers to start pursuing this. Um, but you know, when you bring in these different advocates, or we call them ambassadors or champions for your cause, um, the best practice in actually working with them is that you're you're really preparing them for to do this job. Um, so when you have a giving day, um, you can give them a, a toolkit, a social media toolkit. You know, this is some of the stuff, easy word it, wording, um, calls to action that they can post on Instagram, Facebook you know, any type of outlet that they could share via email. That way you're giving them the means to do something. Um, it's encouraging, the wording's already there. You're not asking them to sit down and write an appeal for you, it, it's there. Um, they of course can personalize it. We see that they're often personalized from there, but you're working with them to say, you know, here's different messaging that's approved by our institution that, you know, can make it really easy for you to do something like this. So that's half the battle, right? Um, and then the other part of it too, is that if you're using a, um, a different, you know, platform for something like this, like community funded, and you had, let's just say you had 50 different ambassadors that you're bringing in for your giving day, you can set goals for them. Um, so you can actually say, we have 50 ambassadors, they're reaching out for us. Um, we are, we're really looking for each one of them to bring in five donors. You can start it really small. You can say we're also, or the flip side of it, we're looking at a dollar goal. We're looking for each one of them to bring in a hundred or $500. Uh, the reason for this is just like the reason for a giving day is that you have something that you're tracking against. Um, when you're using a tool like this, uh, the link that they get is unique. I can send a link to my immediate family and friends to support a cause that I care about. And they can see one, it comes from me with my appeal um, or a appeal, I should say. And then right there, it also says, now I have two out of my five donors to hit my goal. Um, and so they can see what I'm tracking against. They can participate. Like Todd said earlier, it's you, you want to put an attainable goal out there um, so that someone feels like they can make a difference if they're giving right then. Um, so I think it, it's twofold. You want to make sure they're prepared. You also want to make sure that um, if you can, that they have goals that they're tracking against. A few other things we've heard are incentives for some of these donors. Um, it doesn't have to be, or sorry, for ambassadors. It doesn't have to be a, a gift card or a monetary incentive, but it could very much just be, you know, a t-shirt from the institution. It could be a shout out on social media or your website. Um, it could be that if they are the top ambassador for your event, then you are you know, allowing part of a match to go to their fund of choice. We've seen a lot of really unique, cool ways to really get these ambassadors involved. Um, and I would say that just to kind of bring in one other question I saw, you know, the best practice in actually including these these different volunteers or ambassadors is so that they can help make that appeal for you. They're leveraging their networks. All of the messaging on Giving Day is not central. Um, it's coming from different people. And, and I think that that's really incredibly important when you're looking for engagement. Uh, Danielle, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to add a real world example of what yeah. you were saying. I think that is brilliant. Everything you said is perfect. Well, a thing that I did before was um, we had a video that we wanted to promote on a Giving Day. So mm -hmm. what we did to our base was we gave them a sneak peek like a couple days before to say, hey guys, here's what we're going to promote. They feel special that they got to see it. And then we followed up the two, email day, two emails to that group on Giving Day. One was, we are posting that video at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. Would you please go comment and share it? And then we followed up later in the day and we made it, like you said, very easy for them to post it themselves. Like just click here, it'll literally, it's gonna type everything you want. It's gonna use the thumbnail that we want you to use because I've, I've relied on donors to be creative and they'll borrow your logo and stretch it out. They'll take a picture they had on their phone, like, like giving them a toolkit and giving them the exact thing you want to post that's editable is brilliant. Don't let them do it themselves. It'll be, it can be a nightmare. But anyway, get them, get them involved. The sneak peek's not a bad idea. And literally um, pinging them throughout the day to say, would you do this for me? Would you do this for me? And they'll do it. They'll do it. They love the organization. They probably already have given, and now they're ready to be your ambassador. 
and then thank them, thank them often for having done it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Great. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left here. Um, let, let's go with uh, a question that maybe all of you guys can answer. I want to get back to the very first question we got on this uh, webinar from Brian. And what do we need to be prepared to do on the giving day? And I don't know, I'm going to put all four of you on the spot here. But if you could give, I know we've given some tips and uh, ideas throughout this past 50 minutes, but if there is one takeaway for somebody to be prepared on a giving day, what would all four of you say? Anyone want to go first? Do you think, do you think it's a, a giving day in general or like this, on December 1st? On your uh, general giving day, not necessarily giving Tuesday. Go first. I would say to have a plan. Um, I know that's really general, but I've seen some really well executed giving days where there's a plan where it says, um, like Todd was saying earlier, you make it easy. It's seven o'clock is your first appeal in the morning. Um, at 10 a.m. we announce our challenge. At noon, we bring our president in to you know, give a thank you, have a video that's streaming. You have your content lined up, you have a plan for the day, you have a plan for your ambassadors, but you centrally are managing one plan where when you wake up, there can be surprises, but you don't have any surprises in front of you. Everything's lined out, you know, all of your appeals for the day. Um, Jennifer said this earlier, but at the end of your event, you might open it up another day to bring people in to hit that goal or, or to pass that goal. But understandably, you know what work you have cut out for you. Um, so I've seen some giving days go off really well. It doesn't have to be really intricate, but you know, even if you say every three hours we have something, you know, every three hours we have some type of push. If you can do that challenge matches or no challenges in matches, I think you can do really well. I, piggybacking on that, I, I would encourage you um, to have all of your stuff lined up ahead of time. You don't need to, and this sounds sort of, um, um, you probably already know this, but just in case, like you can write everything ahead of time. So if your challenge is um, we need such and such number of donors by 11 a.m. in order to unlock this $5,000 gift, pre-write your text, your email in a way that is not specific enough, but you can go ahead and tee it up. It's still moving forward. You, um, so that you're not saying, well, we all, you know, we have, we're 10 donors short or whatever. I guess my, my point is that without going into deep into the weeds, I think it's important that you should um, feel comfortable in writing all of your content and teeing up all of your emails and teeing up all of your social media posts. If you write them ahead of time in a way that you, or if you need a plan A and a plan B, that's fine, but don't, rely on trying to write an email at three o'clock based on the numbers that you saw at 11 o'clock. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that, that would be something I, I feel is important. Yep, that planning in advance just gives you the confidence to roll it out. Um, and we've seen it go really well. And like I said, it doesn't have to be really in depth, but to Kim's point, if you have those templates ready to go, right. just like you're providing to your, your ambassadors or your volunteers, then your team is prepared. And whether or not you're pulled on to a different task, there's someone there that has a full plan in front of them. Um, and I think that that gives you kind of a little bit of breathing room to go into that event and feel really comfortable. Let me add one more thing to the preparing in advance. This sounds so simple, but um, it is so important. Make sure you go in and uh, try, if you're running a giving day, make sure that you and all your ambassadors get in early and try making a gift, that they know how to use the platform, that it's easy. I don't care if it's um, that you're you know, purchasing a platform to use for that day or you're using your own giving day, but there are always surprises. And for instance, if you're really trying to target older donors, or um, then I get sample people from that population to go in and try to use the platform because if people can't figure it out, they're not gonna give. So make sure you iron all those kinks out prior to the giving day. And then um, I know Todd would agree with this, make sure you've got somebody on tap for the giving day who can deal with technical issues if they arise. So. I'll quickly add, just so I can answer this question. I, I agree with what everyone said, and I, I'm going to go back to the lift versus shift, is not only have a plan, 
And there are best practices of when to post and when to, you know, there are some best practices out there, which we probably all have our own case studies. But at the end of the day, you have to have a compelling ask. And you've got to ask the right people the right things. And sometimes we just think, oh, it's Giving Tuesday. We're, we want to raise money. But come with come with a real plan, not only the, the plan of exactly what we're going to do at what time, but is this a good ask to the right group? Like, pick your target and aim at it. This is not a shotgun approach. Shotgun will not, won't be as successful as a laser beam. So think through laser beam. You're going to have collateral damage. You'll get some shotgun, but always aim with a laser. Absolutely. That's so important. Um, I think we have one last question here. Is that right, Katie? Yep, one last question, Jennifer. I'm going to toss it to you. Um, the question is, uh, is there a strategy that you would recommend to make it appear that you're not constantly asking uh, and constantly asking people to give? Yeah, uh, that's a hard one. And one of the complaints about giving days is, is that they can feel like a money grab. And, and that actually happens more when you do it on Giving Tuesday because everybody's grabbing and so even if you only send three messages during the day they maybe are getting 30 messages or a hundred messages from all the organizations and they can't remember who's messaging well and who isn't it's just a lot of noise so doesn't mean don't do it on giving tuesday but i do think when you have your own day you have a little more freedom to reach out more often um, but i would say very vary your messaging so um you know send a letter or an email in advance letting them know that this is coming um, i've got a school that's ramping up for a giving day but we're sending a, a letter out um, in advance so that people who want to some of their older givers can send in a check for giving day um, so that's one type of an ask um, you know we've heard people talk about calling, texting, different social media. So vary your uh, channels that you're using, your weekly newsletter, or we've got another school that's gonna have a big photo booth where kids are taking pictures on giving day. Um, that's a reminder and it's fun to every parent that drops their child off without it actually feeling like an ask. So the more things you can do that are fun to call attention to it, also, thank you messages throughout the day. Thank you. We just unlocked $10,000. Um, keep it from feeling like a constant money grab because we definitely don't want to bother people. And for goodness sakes, we don't want them to unsubscribe um, because we've spammed them too much um, on a giving day. Well, thank you so much. I, that was a great response to that, Jennifer. And uh, we are coming up to the top of the hour. I know we did not get to all of the questions. Um, so our apologies uh, that, that there are just too many to get to. And the thing with giving days is they're usually pretty uh, specific to your organization as well. So we would welcome uh, the opportunity to meet with you guys uh, individually. Uh, Kim is going to share the link uh, to, to sign up to do that. We'll also be sending you a recording of this webinar uh, for your own use or to share with your team or colleagues or peers that you think might also benefit from it. As Danielle said, we're gonna also uh, share the links that she shared. Um, and Danielle, I think if you just wanna wrap it up and give them a teaser of maybe something that they can watch live uh, over the next 24 hours, um, if you're really interested to see it from start to finish, because we have a client that is going live in exactly one minute. So <laughs> if you want to show the page as a teaser, and then we'll, we'll allow you guys to follow along with them. Um, but yes. here it is. Yeah, so this page is going to be flipping over to their live event. It's actually loading the live event right now. Um, this is the University of Wyoming. Um, Community Funded is located in Colorado, and this is kind of a very near, literally near, and a close partner of ours for the last few years. Uh, the page is probably going to flip in just a second um, to go to their live event. It's actually running, um, oh, sorry about that. Um, it's actually running live for, I think, 12 hours today um, or starts at noon it's running for 24 hours um, so it's going to be noon to noon um, they have several different and it's going to be probably loading and in, in the process of loading right now so we'll be sending this link out but noon to noon um, for their giving day it is 
a push for several different areas of campus. There's going to be matches, challenges galore on this type of giving day. They have so many of them. Uh, so this is going to be a really fun one to watch. We will share the link with you afterwards and the goals um, so that you can watch it live and, and check it out. And even more importantly, I think tomorrow you can see the results that are coming in. So a uh, 24 hour giving blitz. Thank you so much, Danielle. That was not planned that they would be going live right when we were. Oh. <laughs> um, I but, showed it earlier, but they, they <laughs> had a noon to noon, so it didn't work out, but we'll share it with you guys. So if this was fun, think of how much fun it's going to be to follow somebody live for the next 24 hours. So um, you can watch the results come in. Luckily here in America, we are conditioned to that um, after last week. So this will be a little more fun. Let's watch them hit their goal. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to following up with you guys in the next 24 hours with that information. More importantly, we look forward to connecting with you guys one-on-one -on -one as questions come up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good one.